Number 10, patterns. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to notice a pattern. What's that pattern exactly? Well, I'm starting to notice that maybe other Europeans were nicer than at least Maylander ones. I'll get into it. Was Vikings giving their women's rights messed up? No, of course not. I'm not a monster. However, you just gotta understand that a lot of other women in Europe did not share these privileges, like owning property, marriage rights, they even had the right to be warriors. While only a small fraction of women were involved, there are a couple sources that refer to female warriors, such as the War Maidens. Now, mind you, Vikings were coastal raiders, not so much a professional army, but still, it's about the freedoms, so you slay on, Valkyrie warrior, slay on. Number nine, marriage. Okay, well, there was more freedom, but let's be honest, this was a long time ago and not 2022, so not everything was perfect. The marriages were oftentimes arranged by both families and watched over by elders. What's the average age of a bride-to-be, you ask? Well, the bride is a little bit older, and some might call it a midlife crisis, but she's getting married at the age of 13. Lucky number. Sadly, this is just how it went for many civilizations of the day. I'll make the joke again that you don't have that long to live back then, so sure, it makes sense, I guess. Just looking back through the lens of time just makes my skin want to crawl when you do the ugh, yucky. I'll stick to the coastal raiding and the pillaging, thanks. Number eight, grooms, tombs, and drogers. Ladies, wasn't your wedding night beautiful, surrounded by friends and family, a nice meal, and if you've been married long enough, maybe even some bad hair and tuxedos that went out of fashion the second you walked off the altar all while being recorded on the first camcorders that were big enough to be bazookas. God, I miss the 70s and 80s. Well, Vikings had some weird things going on too. No, not those bright blue tuxedos. I never understood how that was in style. It was just really weird. Vikings had this tradition where the groom would raid his family's tomb and retrieve a ceremonial weapon. Afterwards, he would take a very hot bath and sweat out the scent of the tomb, I guess? I'm not really sure. Where then his hair was stylized and somewhere a symbol of four was placed on him. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like a lot. I prefer our tradition of drinking too much in the sun before the wedding starts and falling over at the altar. That's a much better one. Number seven, blood. Ladies, if your husband's dungeon crawling wasn't enough to creep you out, then the poor Viking women had more strange traditions for you. The Gothi, or basically a Viking priest, who makes the wedding happen would often sacrifice an animal in front of the whole wedding to prove that he was capable of commencing a wedding, pouring blood on himself and oftentimes spraying the newlyweds as it was seen as good for some strange reason. For immediate family, you might want to sit back as you're in the splash zone. And because this is the time before well-taught and understood sanitation, I'm sure there was a grand feast afterwards. I'm sure that won't make anyone sick, right? Number six, quiet time. You might be thinking to yourself, Okay, Big Chad, having blood sprayed on me at my wedding is kind of messed up. But you haven't made your chief joke yet. Does that mean there's something worse than impersonating 1976 Carrie at our wedding? Well, yes. Yes, there is. And actually, I'm glad you asked. So, when two people fall in love and get married, and maybe have a little bit too much champagne, they go home to put on the final signatures of the marriage. If you catch my drift, two young lovers dancing the devil's dance in the bedroom sheets for the first time because everybody waits until marriage. However, for Viking women, there's a tradition that us today would be mostly uncomfortable with. Or, I mean, at least if you don't have an OnlyFans, maybe not, I don't, I, I don't know. But when the young couple went back to do what young couples do, they had witnesses. Oh yeah, that's right. At least six witnesses, apparently, just to make sure things go over smoothly. I moseyed on into town the other day, and uh, you know what the chief said? That ain't it. Number five, housewife. Ladies, I hear you. No woman wants to be told by a man to cook, clean, and be a housewife. But for Viking wives, this was half the case. Not so much misogynistic as it was just really a necessity. While a lot of Viking life was more than naval raids and pillaging, and while women warriors most likely took part in said pillaging, the women in Viking civilizations did a lot of work at home. Cooking, making clothes, and a whole list of duties that I know I could never do. Truth of the matter is, Vikings were big burly fighters and still required the tender care of a woman. All patriarchy aside, imagine how hard life would have been back then without one another. As for today, I don't think you understand how hard it would be for me personally to sew a hole in my own clothes. Many of underwear have been lost to me not being able to sew so long underwear. Number four, score! I heard you work for the companions. What do you do, fetch the mead? 
That's a Skyrim reference for anyone that's not sure what that is. It should come as no surprise to anyone that the Vikings enjoyed a little drinky poo once in a while, and by that I mean all the time. Famous for their beers, meads, and wines, Vikings drank to drink for just about any reason, really. Alcohol played a big role in Viking society, as did in many other civilizations of the past. However, this may have had something to do with the mistreatment of their wives. Think about it for a minute. Has your dad ever been drinking a whole case of beer in the sun on a hot summer weekend, where he then proceeded to say things that he's been thinking but needed the liquor courage to say it? And when he said these things, was it not the most nonsensical thing you ever heard? Well, I'm sure that happened to the Vikings too. Just, it was freezing cold out and the men weren't wearing a fresh pair of white sneakers for mowing the lawn, which doesn't really make any sense when you think about it. This may be why women were allowed to leave marriages if they were mistreated. Number three, divorce process. Unlike other women in Europe, Viking women had the option to opt out of their marriages. A divorce for other women in Europe may just cost them their lives. Looking at you, King Henry VIII, However, the process of divorcing is rather awkward. Not that I would know, but I feel like a divorce should be somewhat of a private matter. Unless, of course, you're 90s trailer trash and you end up on Jerry Springer. That ain't my baby. That is not my baby. But even regular folks like you and me can still have their dirty laundry out to air, especially if your marriage is property and children to decide over. While not as messy as daytime television from a forgotten era, the Vikings made their divorces rather public, as that was the divorce process itself. The woman would have to call witnesses to the married bed, or rather just the home, and declare she was divorced. Imagine being pulled off a grueling day's work to be told the lady from the other side of the village is getting divorced. I'm gonna get back to my farm, lady. Jeez. Number two. Far out, man. As if drinking copious amounts of ale and mead wasn't enough to upset a marriage, how about some recreational use of some wacky substances? Vikings were known for going in a berserker mode when in battle a seemingly blind fit of rage that would see anyone or anything in the Viking's way cut down without mercy. There may have been an answer for this aberrant behavior. Mushrooms. Yes, that kind. Some scientists believe that these mushrooms with mind-altering effects grew in areas not too far from the Vikings, and once discovered would lead to some interesting results. Because a large man with a very sharp axe and a belly full of beer is exactly who should be consuming the same kind of mushrooms that may or may not make Pink Floyd's album sound 10 times better. Number one, Nati Nati. The chief came sailing into port today and said this isn't it. That's right, I did two chief jokes today because that's how messed up this is. Viking men of the past, I'm putting you in the naughty corner, bad Vikings. See, like previously mentioned, Vikings were more than just coastal pirates. They had villages, farms, etc. Just like the rest of Europe. But alas, they did do some pillaging. Oftentimes when going on a raid, one of the many things that was taken from other civilizations and villages was women. Oh yes, not just stocks of gold and grain, but the villages women too. Where they would be taken back to the Vikings, where they would be put into YouTube's least favorite S word for um, well, you could probably guess what for. Some were married off and some were probably put to work. This is why the Vikings are going in the naughty cone. At least the women could divorce, right? At number 10, non-stop party. What is the longest amount of time you've gone out to party? A couple hours, maybe a weekend? Well, I don't think it could ever compare to how long the Vikings partied. The Vikings would have probably had a good old chuckle if they knew our parties only lasted a few hours. They'd be like, ha, look at these weaklings. Anyway, these guys could probably out party anyone. Their biggest festivities, like the ones held after large expeditions or for weddings, would typically last for days, but their major feasts like the ones they would use to celebrate the winter solstice may have lasted upwards of 12 days. Now that's a lot of party stamina. I would probably need about 50 Red Bulls to even try and keep up with these Vikings. Number nine, actual really good food, like pretty decent food. If you're a foodie, then I do have some good news for you. The Vikings were apparently like pretty decent cooks. For the time, anyways. They stock their parties with roasted meats like poultry, horse, and beef, with platters of greens, fruits, and buttered vegetables. Beer, ale, mead, and fruit wines were the common beverages, and heavy drinking was encouraged. Not unlike bars today, where there's always that one person who keeps secretly buying tequila shots for everybody, and then you're like, okay, fine, I'll take it because I don't want to be rude, you know what I mean? Anyways, considering the fact that parties would sometimes last for weeks on end, having a lot of food in their party hut was super important. They needed enough to last them until the partying was done, which who knows when that would be. At number eight, rap battles. 
Every party has to have some kind of activity, right? I mean, yeah, we can all stand around listening to music and kikiing it up, but it's way more fun to have activities to participate in, right? Well, the Vikings certainly knew how to throw a party because they had their collection of party activities to choose from, and it sounded kind of like a hoot and a half until we get to the other parts of this list and, you know, just throw that out the window. They would set up games like dice and chess, or at least their early Viking version of chess, and even board games. The Vikings also had this super fun drinking game called Flighting, where partygoers would team up and recite poetry. They would drop some sick bars about their conquests and exploits, and would even drop a diss or two at their opponents. Like a Drake versus Kanye moment. Oh, wait, no, they're friends now. Damn. Well, scratch that last part, but you know what I mean. On top of rap battles and board games, Viking parties just wouldn't be a proper event without drinking, and they even played a game to see who could drink the most. Honestly, I kind of feel bad for the Vikings' livers after all that, and imagine that hangover. Yikes. Number seven, vicious tunes. Ever had a neighbor who would decide to throw a banger on like a weekday? Or have a roommate who thinks they are really good at guitar and wants to like prove it 24 seven, they're like, Wah! like 4 a.m. Yeah, it sucks. If you don't enjoy scenarios similar to this, then you would not want to live next door to a Viking encampment. These folks rocked out really hard and for, as we know, a long period of time. They loved live music, as do I, and archaeologists have recovered flutes, hornpipes, and stringed instruments from settlements. But as most of the singers were well into the mead, according to Arab travelers, they weren't easy on the ears? Like picture the moment Bohemian Rhapsody comes on in a bar and the screeches sounds everyone makes as they try to say Galileo like really loud. My voice is dead. That would be awful. One account described their singing comparable to the calls of wild animals. Oh boy, that's, that's rough. But sometimes they would switch it up with some poetry as mentioned by skilled artists called Scalds. At number six, full send or no send. It seems like the Vikings lived by the notion full send or no send because man, the things get wild and crazy at their parties. There was no holding back with these guys. Oh no. I know I previously mentioned some of the activities that the Vikings would have at their parties, but those ones were the tame ones. And if you know the Vikings, they can't have PG friendly shindigs. Of course not. There's gotta be scenes of violence and coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. Other than playing chess and having rap battles, they also had mass casualties. They played games where people literally kicked the bucket, but I guess dying at a party this wild is a good enough way to go. Some of their more dangerous party activities included throwing leftover bones at one another with the deliberate intent of inflicting bodily harm. They also played a full contact bat and ball game that would often end in injury or the big sleep. And they also held a swimming contest. But there wasn't that much actual swimming involved since the point of the game was to hold their opponent underwater for as long as possible. I would have to imagine that these so called games would just make for a vicious cycle because they'd celebrate something, play these games, kill someone and then the funeral will have them celebrating again just to do it all over again. What a wild life these Vikings lived. Number five, drunk sword fighting and other things. Imagine letting a two year old hold a very sharp broadsword. Sounds like a bad idea, right? Well, nobody seemed to think so when they put swords in the hands of drunk Vikings, which let's be honest, that's pretty much what a two year old is, is essentially like a drunk person walking around. Outdoors, Vikings constantly wanted to one up each other on the strength meter. They had weightlifting competitions, who could lift the heaviest stones, they wrestled, held archery contests, and of course sword fighting competitions, as well as all the games Bree mentioned above. Were they sober? Probably not. They also had a game called Togo Honk, which was kind of like tug of war. Men would sit on the ground facing one another, press their feet together, and bend their knees. The goal was to try to straighten your opponent's legs and flip him over. Honestly? That sounds like a blast. Do you think it's a smart idea to put a sword in a drunk guy's hand? No, but it was the Viking era. There were literally no rules except for a few. At number four, not enough chairs. Now we know that these Viking celebrations would often last for days on end, right? So imagine if during all that time you couldn't sit anywhere comfortable. Sounds pretty unfortunate, but it was the reality of a lot of Viking parties. Because these gatherings were so big, hundreds of people would be in attendance, but unfortunately there wouldn't be enough space to sit. To 
try and accommodate their hundreds of guests, Vikings would break out their longest tables and benches, but usually this still wasn't enough space for everyone, so it became kind of a rule that only the most important people were allowed to sit. Chairs are thought to have been pretty rare, so the most powerful and wealthiest Vikings were allowed to sit in chairs. Everyone else had to fend for themselves, either sitting on uncomfortable benches or just standing around. Now doing this for a couple of hours? No problem. For a two week celebration? You can count me the heck out. If my tushy is not comfortable, I'm going home. Number three, fertility celebrations. So we talked a lot about what Vikings actually did back then and how they partied. Uh, they partied pretty hard. But now we're talking about what kind of festivals they had. This holiday is celebrated on April 30th in Finland, Sweden, and Germany, but goes all the way back to the Vikings. This night is called Waluburgas Night, or Waluburgas Night, or I probably said it wrong, but let me know. And is named after a woman called Valborg. She was born in 710, somewhere in Dorset slash Wessex, as the niece of Saint Boniface. She Traveled with her brothers to Württemberg, Germany, and became a nun. She lived in a convent of Heidenheim and became renowned for her healing powers and was canonized as a saint after she died. This celebration is in honor of her, however, it was originally a pagan celebration called Beltane, a celebration of the return of summer. Viking fertility celebrations took place in and around April 30th, and due to Valborg claiming this date as well, the two celebrations became one and the same eventually. Viking fertility celebrations usually involved sacrificing an animal or two of some kind and included all of the above. At number two, harvest slash winter night celebration. Next up in celebrations to mark on your calendar, we have the harvest slash winter night that took place on October 31st. It can also be referred to as elf blessing, dis blessing, or fray blessing. Kind of like our spooky tradition today, it was a time of honoring the ancestral spirits, spirits of the land, the vanir, along with the powers of fruitfulness, wisdom, and of course, death. A little brutal yet kind of merciful in a way, the animals who were weren't going to be able to make it through the winter were smoked or made into sausage. It was often led by the women of the household. They left the last sheep in the field as an offering to Odin, though this varies. It also marks the start of something called the wild hunt. The roads and fields became territory of ghosts and trolls and marks the beginning of the darkest and coldest time of the year. The festivities and feasts are particularly joyous and they mainly aim to celebrate kinship, accomplishments, and the tales of the year. Last but not least, Yule. This last one is perfect for the season we are entering and a great way to end the list. The festival of Yule was, slash kind of still is, a celebration of 12 days. It was the most important of all Norse holidays and began on the night of December 20th. The god Ingvi Freyr rides over the earth on the back of his shining boar, bringing light and love back into the world. Later, Christianity influenced things, changing the god to Baldur, then Jesus who said to be reborn at the festival. For the Vikings, Yule signified the beginning and end of all things, taking place at the darkest time of the year. Children were said to leave their boots outside filled with hay and sugar for the god's journey and in return they would receive a little present. Sound familiar? On top of that, the celebration would include drinking, feasting, songs, games, banquets, and sacrifices to the gods and the ancestor spirits for the 12 days. They even had what was called a Yule tree, which inspired the use of the Christmas tree today. Number 10, starting off strong with animal court. That's right, in the middle ages, apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were, of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that, so they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding, number nine. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah, cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament which must be observed by God but not only God the families had to make sure the ceremony was official 
all the way to the wedding night. Very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union. That's right, the tickly boo, the boo boo, the jiggy. Yeah, yeah, that's right, your parents, your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the middle ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Trafia started dancing in the street and by the end of the week 40 people joined in and by the end of the month 400 people joined in. It was nuts. It was like a massive never ending rave. Initially physicians thought folks were just stressed out so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point they were like oh, we better cut this off and so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray, and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in, and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared, and the more pronounced the cod piece, well, I think you... I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women on the other hand had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the middle ages. We have literally almost tried everything and I fear what happens next like women's fashion we just we've done a lot of stuff anyways in the middle ages a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face why no idea maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead who knows but either way it was a big deal so what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows hairline and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like their hair would be like this far back. Number five, Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy-turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia, which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders, or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like, this is a sin. But despite the ban, it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine, especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean, technically they're already wearing kind of dresses, their long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip, or more usually, place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting, though, is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors, 
and therefore relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got, fell sick with a cold. He died that way. It was a lot. Number three, here lies the heart. As you can expect, death was everywhere in the Middle Ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of four. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men, you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding, or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh, wow, what's happening? Their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield, there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number two, the mystery plays. If you weren't busy trying to avoid the Black Dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds, which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good, otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round, so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title, I have to say football, because football had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really really violent. You could <laughs> you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football, you could use any part of your body to, to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either, because uh, soccer still exists today somehow. 